Okay, there we go. Hello, Eugene. Hello, Rob. How are you? Very good, my friend. What have you been up to since you and I last talked? Well, I wrote a second book, and I'm marketing the book right now. It's called Paris on My Mind, Talks of Paris, James Baldwin, and Harlem. Now, speaking about Paris, uh, I was reading the information that you were kind enough to send to our producers, and uh, you had quite a time in Paris. Yeah, you know, I really believe that I programmed myself to have this paranormal experience because when I was preparing to go to Paris, mm -hmm. I kept telling myself that something was going to click in Paris. And then I also kept repeating that I'm returning to a home that I've never been before. So it seemed like the spirit guided me on the trip and the entire trip was just something very, very difficult to believe. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, you know, humming songs and then I would hear the song in the next five minutes. And I, don't, I, I shouldn't say the next five minutes, but I would hear the song later. And uh, it seems like nearly everything I thought of, it, it, it manifested. And when I got to the Louvre, this was the 4th of January, 1998. I spent maybe five or six hours looking at everything except art. And I told myself that I wanted to see the Mona Lisa. And when I took the elevator or walked up to, to the place where the uh, art, the paintings were, something just happened to me. It was as if I had seen color for the first time. And there was like a heavy, it felt like a heavy overcoat had been draped over my uh, shoulders. And then the place became very foggy. And then all of a sudden the paint from all the paintings disappeared. Mm -hmm. It looked like uh, movie screens that were just white waiting for the film to begin. And then all of a sudden um, the paint came back and then they were so bright, the colors were so bright. And then the uh, paint formed into an orange waterfall and it came towards me and it hit me in the stomach. Mm -hmm. And then after that, it sounded like a wet paintbrush had slapped me across the face. And then I came out of it, but I just, it was somewhat frightening because nothing like this has ever happened. Not to this extent because I've had uh, other experiences, and this was dealing with art. When I was in St. Louis, 1984, 1987, I went to the old courthouse on 4th and Broadway. It's 4th Street on the east side, Broadway on, on the west side of the courthouse. And I was under the dome, and I saw a man coming out from the dome, mm -hmm. and it looked like he was falling on me or going to fall on me, so I ran out of the area. And it happened twice, the same experience. I, it's very difficult to believe. But even as a kid, before I could talk, I was trying to figure out who Harry Truman was. Harry Truman lived 50 miles south of my hometown. And he lived in Independence, Missouri. And he was in my home quite frequently. But I could hear my parents talk about Harry Truman in St. Louis. I could figure out what St. Louis was, but I just couldn't figure out who Harry Truman was. A voice within my head says, I think he works with daddy, but he doesn't work in the same department. And I think he works either in the employment office or with the union. And then maybe a year and a half or so after that, I was on the train. It was an exhibit called the Freedom Train. It was probably 1947, 1948. And I had finished touring the train and a voice within my head said, there he is. And I said, who, God? It says, no, that's the president of the United States. Wow. And I looked up and there was President Truman and he pointed his finger at me and my head went straight down to the floor. And that was the end of that. But it's just something, I don't know. I've always been very inquisitive and 
at the time that I first heard about Harry Truman, I, I couldn't talk. But two or three years later, when I saw him, there was a part of me that recognized him. And I was just somewhat surprised. How did you feel knowing that that was Harry S. Truman, President of the United States, pointing his finger at you, Eugene right. Crowley? Yeah, since I was I was probably three years old at the time, mm -hmm. and my sisters were with me, but I didn't. I don't think I even told them. But it just didn't sink in. But there was something I can remember when Harry, our President Truman, was. <laughs> I'm sorry. Are you all right? I'm I'm fine. I'm fine. Okay, good. Yeah, good. I was in the third grade when Harry Truman. Um, left the White House mm -hmm. and I was very angry. I was sitting in my classroom looking straight ahead at, at the front of the room and I told myself there's going to be a blizzard, a buck passing in this country since Harry Truman is leaving the country. And I could see this. I could see snow and just dollar bills floating around the area. Later that year when uh, I guess it was King George the sixth Queen Elizabeth's father, when he died, I was sitting in my classroom in the same seat and I could see in the back of my head, it was like a person going through a maze. And for some reason that was green in, in the background, mm -hmm. but I was just upset that the uh, king had passed away. And I didn't know later, I says, I didn't know that kings could die and I was just somewhat upset. But that was in the third grade. But I just said that there's going to be a buck, a, a blizzard of buck passing in this country since Harry Truman, since President Truman would leave the country. But uh, he was one of my heroes or one of my first heroes. And I still admire President Truman. And uh, the king that passed away, who's the father of Queen Elizabeth, was King George. Yeah. Was it the yeah. sixth? I think it was. Well, he wasn't Henry VIII, that I know. Or yeah. Peter Noon would have written a song about him instead of uh, Henry VIII. Yeah. I, I just like to go back to the Louvre because I've always wanted to go there. And I have to ask you did you see the Mona Lisa? Yes, I saw it. I what saw was it. it like? Well, it was in a glass, you know, there was a big, I can't say big, but a, a glass that protected it. Mm -hmm. And I guess there were several people around the uh, painting, and I didn't take a real close look, but I, I did know that I saw it, and I was happy that I did see it. And uh, I guess that was after I had this event with the paintings, and it was sort of like an alcove. And I even thought I was going up some stairs, and the... Uh, Incident reminded me of the, um, what's this building in Detroit? The Fisher Building in Detroit is, is a very beautiful Art Deco building and it has like a balcony and there's mm -hmm. paintings on the wall. And I told myself this reminds me of the Fisher Building in Detroit. So, but there's something about art that just makes my physical eyes close and my spiritual eyes seem to open. And it's, I think it can only happen when you're not in a hurry because most people tend to run through museums and they're busy trying to get to their next location in the city. But Gene, I you and I, I hate to do this, my friend, but you and I have to take a break now. Uh, we'll be back in a couple of minutes. Exxon Nation, our guest this hour is Eugene Crowley. And uh, Eugene, how can uh, people get a hold of you or how can they buy your books? It's at Amazon.com. Paris on my mind. Thoughts of Paris, James Baldwin, and Harlem. All right, my friend, please stand by. And this is the Exxon. My name is Rob McConnell. This is a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard Monday through Friday from 10 p.m. Eastern until 2 a.m. Eastern right here on the Exxon Broadcast Network at Exxon TV channel. Don't go away.
you enjoy paranormal, sci-fi romance, yet find yourself tired of the same old themes and storylines, then you won't want to miss Kahira O'Donnell's latest exciting release to taste you again. Alien Lord Kane McKean knew the moment that his destined mate was born. He watched from afar, waiting for her to grow from child to woman. However, before she was old enough, she was stolen from her home world by flesh pirates. Kane searched ten long years to find her held in a suspension chamber, a ten-year-old girl in a woman's body. He rescued her and swore to give her time to grow up, but with his very life depending upon winning her as a mate, has he waited too long? Get your copy today. To Taste You Again by Kahira O'Donnell is now available on Amazon or KahiraO'Donnell.com. Welcome back, everyone. Eugene Crawley is our special guest. Eugene is in, I believe, the windy city of Chicago, Illinois. And um, talking about some rather unique paranormal experiences. Prior to, have you always had an interest in art? Well, yeah. I guess I've always scribbled or, mm -hmm. you know, doodle. And sometimes I would, would uh, take uh, a project and, and, and try to complete it. And even my eighth grade teacher mentioned that a, a painting, it was really crayons. I mm -hmm. drew of a second grader and they liked it. It wasn't a masterpiece, but for some reason they could tell that it looked very similar to the person that I, that posed for me. And well, we had art in, in grammar school and I really, I don't know, it was just a part of, of the curriculum. And if they put the, uh, material in front of you, we just, you know, we didn't fuss or argue, we just worked with the material. And I can remember, I guess, finger painting, and, mm -hmm. uh, making pictures. And I guess every holiday, the school teacher, our school teacher would put decorations on the window and so art has always been a part of my life. I had an uncle who was an artist. I, he wasn't a full-time artist, but I can remember at my grandmother's house, there was a painting and my grandmother told me it was done by my uncle Charles. So it's been a part of, of our family, but I just didn't really develop art as, you know, a producer of art or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, making paintings or what have you. But I think my aunt could draw and um, my father, he used to draw uh, for me cars, automobiles. So most of them had uh, talent and I just didn't go into art. When I was a kid, I was just into books all, all the time. Uh, what's the uh, Golden Books, I believe it was called. My mom and dad brought me, uh, you know, Mother Goose stories. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I was trying to figure out how could a cow jump over the moon and i thought to myself that cow could really jump mm -hmm. and uh but it was just a part of my childhood and i spent most of the my childhood reading i read all the books in the uh neighborhood library three times before i was 11 years old my goodness so reading was just a part of me and, and fine arts and so forth but i never did get into drawing uh seriously but I do like uh, art. There's just, like I said before, my physical eyes seem to close, whereas my spiritual eyes can see something that the spiritual, that the physical eyes don't see. Why do you think that, uh, oh, let me, uh, let me rephrase the question. Were you drawn to go to Europe or, or was you know, it? Go ahead. No, no. I, I... Okay. One day I was in the uh, suburbs, Northwest suburbs, and I saw a expressway sign that said Palatine. And I told myself, I want to see the real Palatine Hill. And I believe that same afternoon, Air France had a sale to Europe, $205 each way. Wow. And so I made plans. And I had another card by TWA 
And I decided to go to Paris, then go to Amsterdam, and I wanted to go to Berlin, but uh, the hotels were all booked up, so they put me in Munich. <coughs> Excuse me. And from Munich, I went to Vienna. From Vienna, I went to Milan. And from Milan, I went to Rome. And then from Rome, I went over to Madrid. And when I got to Madrid, my hotel room was taken. And I took the night train back to Paris. And I wish I had thought, because I could have taken the train at the foot of, the, uh, of Spain and taken a ferry over to North Africa. But since it was my first time in Europe, I didn't know the ins and outs. So I just sure. took the, the uh, night train back to Paris and got in Paris maybe two days earlier than I expected. Any plans on going back? I would like to. Uh, the, the entire continent to me, it, it was it was quite an eye opener. And I think the second day or my second leg of the trip, I was in Amsterdam and there was an exhibit. It was called Black uh, Pharaohs. Mm -hmm. and Something told me right then and there, I says, Europe seems to be promoting ancient black history. And but when you really look at Paris closely, you can see all of the Egyptian uh, relics and monuments, obelisks and uh, pyramids all over the place. And it looks like a, a piece of Egypt in the middle or all around uh, Paris. And I was just surprised that they honored the black ancient race in Paris and mostly in Europe because the, the continent is named after a Phoenician princess, Europa. So it's really, if you really know your history, you can really understand and appreciate foreign places. And I taught high school English for 32 years. And when I taught English or literature, I had to teach the background of, of these particular countries where the author had come from. So it's something that uh, I like because I like reading, I like reading history. And I thought at one time that I would major in history, but I majored in English when I went to undergrad school. So, what, do you what do you think about the school systems uh, these days uh, with, with the the change of the format, the change of the... Uh, it's, I know what you're saying because I believe schools should go back to the original uh, plan they had when I was in high school. Or the right. kid, you know, learn. If he didn't learn, he failed. Yeah. Nowadays, kids, uh, the principals, they don't want teachers to fail the kids. They're overworking uh, the teachers. And the education is just messed, to me, it's messed up. Our superintendent of the schools are, is called a CEO, and that's like, a, you know, it's, it's so far from the humanities, and it's like a corporate entity now. Yeah. They're more interested in numbers and statistics. And it, it's just, like I said, they should go back to the time when, when kids learn and when they did their own work. and. No That's right. We're in the uh, school uh, arguing with the teacher over a grade. You know, it, it seems that, it, like I know when I was in high school, you respected the teachers. It was Mr. So-and-so and, -so and Miss So-and-so. We all, the boys had to wear white shirts with a tie, gray flannels, black shoes. There was no peer pressure. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and, you know, you did your homework. You, my dad had to sign my homework. Oh, okay. To show that I did it. Mm -hmm. And I look at today, my grandchildren, for goodness sake, there's there's one who's in university, he's going to become a doctor, and they don't teach kids how to write anymore. It's it's oh. all done electronically on their tablets, on their cell phones. Mm -hmm. Like, what's this world coming to? And what will happen the day that children face a blackout? What's going to happen Yeah, when there's a solar flare and their electronic gizmos don't work anymore? Mm -hmm. It would be quite disappointing to say the least, but yeah. you know, we, 
grew up I grew up before TV and uh, radio was my uh, main source of entertainment. And I love the radio and I can remember telling one of my neighbors to let me know when six o'clock came because I had to listen to Frank Sinatra. And uh, there should be, I don't know, I really can't dictate what we should do because most people want to do what's trendy. And right now this, you know, social media is the thing, but uh, I just wish people would be more aware of Mm -hmm. their language, their speech, because speech and words have very much power. Right. I believe that many people self-destruct because of the words they use. And words are very powerful and their spirit. And we have to be careful with what we say because we can predict our future, we can predict our success, or we can predict failure. So it's best to choose the words that we use wisely. And Eugene, so- you and I have to take our mid-break, so please stand by, my friend. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. It's a great pleasure talking to you. Exo Nation, Eugene Crowley, and I will be back on the other side of this. But Eugene, we're going to give you all that information on the other side of this break. This is the Exo, and I am Rob McConnell, and you're coming, you're listening to us from our broadcast center and studios in where? That's right. We're not in Hamilton anymore. We're not in Crystal Beach anymore. We're in the city of St. Catharines, the Garden City here in Ontario, Canada. We'll be back on the other side of this break. Don't go away. So I was watching the X-Zone TV channel last night when I was abducted by aliens and they kept repeating to me over and over again, Simultv.com, Simultv.com. What's Simultv.com? That's what I asked them. They had it written on the side of their UFO. How do you spell that? UFO. No, I mean Simultv.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Right. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Interesting that you were abducted by aliens in a Simultv.com UFO last night. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Now that you mention it, I remember now last night, I was awakened from a deep sleep. My great-grandmother was standing there. She said she'd come from the hereafter to tell me about Simultv.com. She even spelled it out for me. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, sonny boy. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, sonny boy. Wow. Yeah. Guys, you'll never guess what my psychic guru just told me. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Exactly. Are you guys psychic too? Of course. We all know about Simultv.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. And Eugene and I are back, XO Nation. Uh, Eugene, if somebody wants to contact you uh, or to get a copy of your book, how do they do it? Your book's plural. I'm sorry, sir. It's one book. Well, I think the first book is available on Kindle, Upside Down World, The Loss of the Sacred Cosmos. It's available at Amazon. But this book here, uh, Paris on My Mind, Thoughts of Paris, James Baldwin, and Harlem can be purchased at Amazon.com. All right. Uh, I can understand Paris. I can understand Harlem. But James Baldwin? James Baldwin, if you if you read his writings, his philosophies, they mm-hmm. mimic or they parallel Socrates and uh, Buddhist teachings, ancient Egyptian teachings, and, of course, Christian uh, teachings. And Baldwin was a pastor at, a, at an adolescent when he was an adolescent. And he, let's say, got religion mm-hmm. at a teenage Eight, when he was a teenager. And it's, it's sort of strange because when I had, or before I had this experience, I had no idea that it was going to happen to me. And in the fire next time, James Baldwin mentioned that he was in the church, he was singing and clapping his hands and uh, figuring out a plot for a story. Then all of a sudden he was on the floor. And it's just like, 
these experiences are episodes that creep up on us and we don't know they're, that they're coming. But going back to, to Baldwin's uh, intelligence and wisdom, it's the wisdom that he uses that, again, parallels uh, ancient Eastern uh, religion uh, philosophies and teachings. And he made, a, he just says, he said the same thing about what Socrates had mentioned or learned in Africa, man, know thyself. He says that people who cause social problems, they don't know themselves. And he was speaking of the spiritual identification, self-knowledge, and that was the priority of the ancient Egyptians and people uh, who lived in a holistic society. And we are this, the culture that we're in now is more external where we build up our bodies, we build up our, our muscles and mm -hmm. our outward, our external uh, features. Whereas the inner cultures, the past cultures, they purified their thoughts, their words, what they said. And as I said before, words have power and we have to be careful uh, what we say because these words, they do have power. and we manifest our future with the words that we speak. So it's best to use positive words and words that can bless us and not heal or harm us. Because many people today, they say almost anything without being aware of the power of words. So it's, you know, I never read James Baldwin because he was an American writer and I did not like teaching sophomores too uh, much. But I read one story, my dungeon shook, and it is a very revealing story. And he gives uh, lessons or strategies how to avoid the inferiority complex. And he mentions the fact that people who are inferior, they project their shortcomings onto their victims, hoping that the victim will become inferior or mm -hmm. to react to what the person uh, is calling him. And Baldwin mentions that we should keep our dignity. It's not worth uh, retaliating or reacting to these uh, threats and uh, negative images that are thrown uh, to people. So it's more or less, I still say following the Eastern way, the ways that the Egyptians and the Greeks and those who sought self-knowledge they are the best role models. And I believe that to solve our problems, we need the wisdom of the past because today the Western mind is very deceptive and very deceiving and it can come up with new ideas and what have you. But it's to know the truth and the truth will set you free. And this statement is used frequently in, in, in many of Baldwin's writings. And when we know that we are spirit that the spirit, there's no stopping to our achievements when we know that we're spirit, when we keep our mind on the spirit. And this is what we have to do in, in this society because there's just too much violence and too much negativity in our society today. We need to stamp this out. We need to go for self-knowledge as the ancients had done and abide by these words, abide by the laws that govern man, nature, and cosmos. And we just are so stuck with this one, uh, how do you say, the environment, but we are related to to the earth, to mm -hmm. where the cosmos, and most people just don't believe that or they don't realize it. But we were made in the image of God. If we're made in the image of God, we have to, to act like God. We got to use his word, we got to use his wisdom and to me, wisdom is the best answer. It's the decider of many conflicts, especially in the myth of Osiris, where um, Set, the brother of Osiris, killed uh, Osiris. Mm -hmm. And he ran a, a long kingdom, destructive kingdom. and. I guess for several hundreds of years. 
and the thing that really decided the battle between Horus, the immaculate conceived son of Osiris, was the intervention of the God of wisdom. And it's wisdom that will decide our conflicts. And it was wisdom in the past, and it still is today. So the best thing that we have is wisdom. And again, our country, our, our society, they focus on cliches, on telling people off, but the best decider of any conflict is that of wisdom. And this is what we need to, to, to use more of. But you see, in, as I see it, people look at the social media as a way of spreading wisdom, whether it is real wisdom or fabricated wisdom. So how do we get around that, my friend? Uh, well, to me, the, the, the models, the first models were the ancient people. I mean, mm -hmm. we get our, the time that we use, you know, the 60 second minute and the 60 minute hour, those, those go back to ancient Babylon. And many people, especially pastors, talk about our system today. It's the Babylonian system, but, um, there was a lot going on in Babylon because when the the uh, people, I guess they were the house of, of Judah, when they were taken to Babylon, they uh, they were the smartest of, 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 of the people who were taken captive. But yet, some of them stayed in uh, Babylon. They didn't go back to uh, Judah. So it's you know we see one side of the story, but we don't tend to to get the whole picture because we tend to focus on the negative side yeah. but i was always told we have to be objective there's always two sides to every story and some people see there's three or four more sides so yeah. just to be open you see i agree there's three sides to the story his side her side and the truth okay <laughs> yeah there are i think there's some famous quotes in the park Across the street from the uh, Harold Washington Library, and I think I saw a quote that says, "There's always three or four sides to a story," mm -hmm. and it could have been I don't know if Stevenson, uh, Robert Louis Stevenson, or one of the writers, uh, British writers. But you know, we just think that that there's this one side, but there can be various sides. And today we're not so objective. It's just like I said before, people want to come up and tell somebody off, and they want to go and they want to have an argument. They want to mm -hmm. use the reptilian brain, and they want to make people feel bad. And we shouldn't do this. And it's rare when people have a conversation instead of asking people to clarify something or can you say more, they just denounce it, and that's just cutting off the conversation or cutting off the communications. And we need more communications to, before we make these decisions. You know, the Bible says do not judge, but it's like every five seconds someone is judging people. That's right. And, you know, judge ourselves. You know, if we had mm -hmm. self-knowledge, we would not be bringing people down. And we would share or try to help people to find their true self, their true selves. And this is what these uh, heroes did. They went on a journey and they found the treasure and they brought it back to their community so the community could enjoy it. They didn't think of themselves. They were not selfish people, they were selfless. And this is what we need to do. I think, you know, we can gain all the material things that we have, but still it, it, it remains an emptiness for somebody. And many people are not happy with all of the material things that they have. And they're still searching for happiness. The true happiness is within. And we can be happy just by thinking happy thoughts. But we live in a society that is very negative and it's very violent and we should have a different attitude, a different paradigm. Paradigm uh, survival of the fittest is still mm -hmm. quite popular today where it should be the survival of the wisest. And Deepak Chopra said this in 1995 or 1996, it's been 25 years or so, but we still, most people admire the warrior type the person who can, you know, slay so many people and, mm -hmm. you know, do outstanding deeds and so forth, but mostly with his uh, physical uh, attributes. But we need to be more 
more, um, we need to be wiser. We need to think of, of what we are doing before we do it. But we are so, so into being the, the, the warrior that we don't think, we think that something else is weak, but it's not weak. But we just got to do what the angels did when they settled their uh, conflicts. And All right, my friend, you and I have to take our final break. Eugene, great talking to you. Thank you for sharing your insight with us. Sure. And uh, Exo Nation, our guest this hour is Eugene Crawley. He's the author of Upside Down World, The Loss of the Sacred Cosmos and Paris on My Mind. Thoughts of Paris, James Baldwin and Harlem. And we'll both be back on the other side of this break as we wrap up this night and this segment here in the Exxon from our broadcast center and studios in St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada. My name is Rob McConnell. Don't go away. be accosted in her bed and abducted by aliens was the last thing Michelle expected. Yet the fateful morning of her destined death changed everything. Lord Lan Ramos, Alpha King of Vidar, the monstrous befanged alien looming over her bed, was her destined mate come to save her from certain death. He is a telepathic mute shifter. Can Michelle accept him and his animal? Once on Lan's home planet, Michelle becomes increasingly psychic, revealing her as the fabled Oracle of Vidar. As factions conspire to destroy them, will they overcome mounting threats? Will Michelle's growing gifts save them or ultimately destroy her? Don't miss this sci-fi shifter romance with charismatic and engaging characters. Get your copy today, The Oracle of Vidar, available on Amazon or kahiraodonnell.com. That's C-A-H-I-R-A-O-D-O-N-N-E-L-L.com. And welcome back, everyone. Before we say so long, I'd just like to thank our guests from uh, from tonight. We had Dr. Shelley Kerr, the first uh, segment. I'm sorry, we had Gary Wimmer. He was on the first uh, segment. Dr. Shelley Carr was our second segment. Clarice Connor was our third segment. And my guest this hour is Eugene Crawley. I'd like to thank everyone here at the Exxon at Relmar McConnell Media Company in the St. Catherine Studios and Corporate Offices, as well as our good friends at Simul TV, and of course, my senior executive producer, my one and only beautiful wife, Laura. And uh, Mac uh, Alexander, he's done a uh, fantastic job getting us out all over the place. And uh, my producer, Craig West. Always enjoy working with you, Craig, and bugging you during the breaks and whenever I get a chance. So thank you, one and all. Our guest this hour is Eugene Crowley. And Eugene, first of all, I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your day and your evening to join us here in the Exxon. Great having you with us. But I have a question to ask you, my friend. It's based on your first book, which was Upside, Upside Down World, The Loss of the Sacred Cosmos. Now, when, in your opinion... Did we lose the sacred cosmos? When we, okay, I wrote in, in that book that when the uh, Germanic tribes came down from uh, Scandinavia and destroyed the mm -hmm. uh, Roman Empire, that was the loss of the sacred cosmos. But then when the uh, Europeans came over to America, the Indians had a sacred cosmos. And the Indians, they, uh, again, were very spiritual. And instead of keeping the, uh, the spiritual orientation of the American Indians, it, their culture was just dismantled. Mm -hmm. And we uh, started this, you know, the United States and it was an exclusive or they did not welcome everybody in uh, the colonies, the, the American colonies. And so 
the sacred cosmos or the spiritual environment of the American Indians was dismantled by the Europeans whose ancestors uh, destroyed the Holy Roman Empire, the Roman Empire. So it's like the sins of the father were instead of coming to a country and getting along, but there's warfare and uh, the Indians were pushed on reservations to the worst parts of, of, of the country and it just destroyed their, their world. And again, when the uh, people from Scandinavia came down and destroyed the Holy Roman Empire, it was the loss of a sacred cosmos. And the, the mother goddess was destroyed. And at one time, Western civilization, when it was called a civilization, when it was a civilization, it was almost identical to Eastern civilization in their honoring the mother goddess. Mm -hmm. And this was taken out of the Western uh, society. And I imagine the Trinity took its place. But again, it's, it's more or less God is, is a father. Uh, and for most people, he's an angry father or a father full of wrath. And this was the uh, God of the Old Testament. But God is a universal. The God, I'm sorry. God is the universal God of love mercy, goodness, and he would not destroy his people. His, his people may destroy themselves, but God is different from the Old Testament into the New Testament. Big time. Big yeah, time. Exactly. Yeah. exactly really. Um, but, I always looked at the as, as, you know, at the Old Testament that the God there was very strict, very demanding. Yeah. Very, very cruel to those who did not follow his way. Mm -hmm. And yet the God of the New Testament, love, compassion, understanding. Why, just, do you think, why do you think this is? I really do believe, and I believe if you read, you were, to me, you, I feel a person has to read Babylonian, what they call mythology, but there may be truth in that mythology because there were people, and there's a writer, there was a writer named Zechariah Sitchin, S-I-T-C-H-I-N. Oh, yes. I, I had Zechariah on the show many times before he passed away. Right. Okay. But he wrote, he could uh, interpret these ancient cuneiform writings of ancient mm -hmm. Samaria and Babylon. And he writes that there were people from a different world and they needed gold for their atmosphere. And so these people who came down, they were super, super uh, intelligent. And eventually they did not want to do uh, this work of mining gold. So they created homo sapiens and they took part of their DNA and mixed it with the, uh, the people who were already here. Mm -hmm. So eventually they, you know, came up with a race that was created to be a slave race. And this is the beginning of Homo sapiens, according to Sitchin. And there's just so much about uh, the ancient world that our uh, society covers up because there's pictures of, of, of a pyramid or a face on Mars where one of these people from this different world was uh, exiled to Mars and there's a big face, human face on Mars. Well, so well, when it gets to the face of Mars, that was, that was uh, discredited by a number of scientists and at NASA itself. Well, I still say that we can denounce something without really thorough study. And mm -hmm. there's even pyramids on Mars and even the name Cairo is related to Mars. But I believe our society, the mainstream society in academia, they have a way of denouncing things that they just don't understand. It's, diff it's a different mindset. Well, let's, let's look at academia for a moment here. You know, th they're still teaching kids in school today that Christopher Columbus discovered the Americas when he didn't. You know, he, he was just one of many explorers that landed on the shores. Uh, you know, he, he was in, what was it, the Caribbean instead of the... Right. Right. You know, right. it was the, you know, you have the Vikings, you have the Irish, you have 
the seafarers who crossed it from Europe into into America in order to get the nickel for their bronze. Like, come on, why don't we, they just teach us the truth? They want the uh, supremacy of the white race or the Western society, which is not really, it's not true of what they, no. they right. Because I believe the Phoenicians came up looking for tin uh, in the upper Great Lakes or someplace mm -hmm. around there, but you won't hear this. And uh, many history books are, are, are wrong when they identify the uh, Kushites as Caucasian. They were black. They were one of the sons of Ham. And the Bible is all about black people. And yet academia and mainstream society, they have a way of telling the story that would benefit them or would make their books look great or what have you, but they're all wrong. And Baldwin says that if we contest or challenge the definitions of white America, that white America will kill us. And I think that most people get angry when we try when a person is trying to correct them. And at one time I thought prejudiced people and bigoted people were people without education. But most people who are who are educated in their own field. They d denounce things that are not familiar with them. They call it pseudoscience and, and anything without truly investigating it. And at one time, I can remember that you had to do the research before you came up with some judgment or conclusion. But most people today, they just want quick answers. And I think the social media is a big disaster for some people who want to be you know, the first to answer, the loudest to come up with the mm -hmm. comment or what have you. But we got to go back to the past because they strove for self-knowledge. When you know that you are a spirit, you can use your spirit to do miracles and to help humanity. We're here to help humanity and save the earth. And we're not supposed to be bombing uh, all over the world and That's killing right. You know, that's wrong. That's a not kill. But a second. I, I hate to do this, my friend, but we've run out of time for tonight. First of all, thank you so much. Love to have you back on to continue this conversation. And uh, what are your final thoughts for our listeners tonight? I want them to be aware, to seek their true selves, and to know that there's something in them that's greater than those in the world. Uh, there was a comment on the back of the first book that I wrote. There's more to life than what we've been told. There's more to life. There's more to us because we just think of the human side of the individual, but we are spirits. And with spirits, we have the same power that created the earth that makes the world go around. But we just don't believe that. I just wish that people would be more spiritually aware. Read the classics. Read Socrates, read Aristotle, read Plato, and you'd be surprised that what we you can get a new you by reading what the, what the uh, the ancients uh, wrote. This is Eugene. I want to thank you so much for joining us. Take care of yourself. Be safe, my friend, and I look forward to the next time you're back here with uh, us in the X Zone. Uh, thank you so much. All right, Exo Nation, that's it for tonight. Wow, four hours, four great guests. Hour number one, Gary Wimmer. Hour number two, Dr. Shelley Carr. And number three, Clarissa Connor. And of course, our last guest this hour, the one and only Eugene Crowley. Now, I'll be back tomorrow night at 10 o'clock as once again we cross the time space continuum to this place that I call the Exo. It's a p place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. And as I've been saying all night, we're here with you Monday through Friday from 10 p.m. Eastern until 2 a.m. Eastern on the Exxon Broadcast Network, the Exxon TV channel, Simul TV, and our broadcast affiliates around the world. So until tomorrow night, everyone, remember to always keep your eyes to the sky and your heart to the light. Good night, everyone.